Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the 13th and next to last lecture in the series on the selective gross pathology of the respiratory system. And we're going to cover miscellaneous diseases I couldn't shoehorn into any of the other categories. So it's a grab bag today of some really interesting diseases. Before we start, as I always do, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who over the years have provided me these fantastic images which allow me to put these lectures together. Well, as we are wont to do in these lectures, let's start at the front of the animal. This is a great picture by Dr. Perry Habecker of New Bolton Center, and it is a split skull of a horse, and what you're looking at are these large fluid-filled cysts. These are nasal cysts, they're horses, they're incidental findings, they're probably secondary to chronic rhinitis or sinusitis, you see them in other species. Um, usually they start out as flat or sessile, but then they become pedunculated. Um, and as they get bigger, they tend to uh, compromise the venous and lymphatic drainage, so they get bigger and bigger. The core has chronic inflammation, similar to what we're going to see in cats in just a minute. It's covered by hyperplastic mucosa and sometimes over time they can actually become fibrous with organization and maturation of the collagenous stroma. You can also see them in uh, in the ox. Here's a, a picture uh, from a little dark. I probably should clean that one up, but uh, it's a dark picture uh, of a similar uh, sinus polyp uh, arising from the turbinate bones of an ox. Uh, a nice picture. Thank you, Derek Mosier, for this one. And here's one from the John King collection. Two separate cats, same day at necropsy. And what you can see, or you can see these large nasopharyngeal polyps, and that's what they're called in cats, nasopharyngeal polyps. Um, they arise in the nasopharynx. They can also rise in the eustachian tube. And when they're in the eustachian tube, they can go outwards through the ear, rupturing the eardrum, or they can come back down and, and, and hang in the back of the throat. And these animals have a terrible time breathing. Once again, it's thought to be the result of chronic rhinitis and sinusitis. It's usually in younger cats, and uh, they're often smooth. They may be ulcerated. It's simply a hyperplastic, a chronically inflamed mucosa over a fibrovascular core. Now another polyp-like mass um, that can cause considerable problem for horses um, usually breeds like Arabians and thoroughbreds and usually in older animals uh, are these large progressive ethmoid hematomas. They generally arise from the ethmoid labyrinth that's why they get their name deep in the in the head, but they may also turn up in the paranasal sinuses. So um, we don't really know why they they start. Perhaps the animal is an athlete, um, and it's breathing very hard, and because of the tremendous pressure within the uh, uh, nasal sinuses at peak exercise, you start to get hemorrhage, and then the hemorrhage over time will continue, and you'll have layers of acute hemorrhage on top of chronic hemorrhage, and the hematoma begins to get larger and it moves forward and it moves forward um, and it occludes more and more of the nasal cavity resulting initially in stertor and then maybe so severe it blocks one side or both of the nasal cavity and then the animal cannot uh, really perform any athletic maneuvers. Now the, the lesion itself is, is interesting bordering on beautiful. Um, you have obviously a combination of acute and chronic hemorrhage, so you'll have a lot of sideriphages in it, um, but you also have extracellular broken down iron pigment in the form of hematoidin, bright yellow, which uh, occasionally accumulates into something that is really poorly named a ceroid sequence, because it's not really ceroid, but uh, it's a, a beautiful aggregate, this bright yellow material forming these radiating spicules, like a sequin that you might wear on a shiny dress or a handbag. Um, 
Within it, you'll have granulomas inflammation, you will have mineralization of collagen fibers, and it's an absolute grab bag. And the first time you see it, you may not recognize it. The first time I saw one, because I was trained at the AFIP right smack in the middle of Washington, D.C., and nobody brought their horses in to be necropsy. So the first one I saw was on my certification exam. It took me a while to figure out what it was, but eventually I got around to it, and I think I got that one right. These can get so big, they will cause pressure, necrosis, and deformity of the surrounding bones, and they can get big enough that they actually peek out of the nostril. People know that uh, they have these progressive ethmoid hematomas. They've been a number of treatments over the years. Probably the worst one was one that's been uh, uh, given up maybe about 20 years ago when somebody came up with a great idea. Hey, I'm gonna inject formalin into this thing and it's gonna stop bleeding. Um, and, and it probably did for several of them. And then they came across a horse that it had gone through the cribriform plate. Remember I said you'd cause pressure necrosis of bones. So when they injected it with formalin, they actually fixed the front part of this horse's brain. So that uh, particular therapy has fallen out of favor, although I do hear from time to time about it still being used. So progressive ethmoid hematoma, and don't treat it with formalin. We've mentioned this before. It's worth mentioning again because we've seen it so many times uh, in lesions of the uh, uh, horses, larynx, and surrounding tissue. But you have all of these polyps. You have this sort of granularity to the larynx and to the area epiglottic folds. And this is not uncommon in animals. Uh, in horses, and it's all lymphoid tissue. People say, well, this animal's had upper respiratory infection, it's had uh, strangles, or it's had EHV, um, but you can see it in animals that haven't had any uh, history of infectious disease, and it simply may be due to stirner, and it might be sort of a, a vicious cycle, because the more stirter you get, the more you stir the air up, there's more inflammation, more stirter, etc., etc. This is all lymphoid tissue, and it's very common in this area in the horse. Okay, I'm going to show you the same lesion in two different species. First species that we're going to look at is going to look at the dog. And what you can see here, we're in the larynx, and here are the cricoretinoideus muscles. Um, you can see the dorsal muscle here. Lateral muscle is in here, but it's very difficult to see. But if you compare the two on either side, you'll see that on this particular side, um, there's not much muscle there. There's a lot. It's very thin. There's a lot of fibrous connective tissue. This one looks fairly robust. This is a condition that in horses and uh, dogs, they are known as roarers and it is atrophy of the dorsal lateral cricoretinoideus muscles, usually as a result of denervation due to damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. It's especially seen on the left side for reasons that nobody really knows, although there are some theories about that. If we look at the disease in the dog, um, there are a number of reasons. Um, damage or trauma to the recurrent laryngeal nerve um, in animals that have been uh, put on choke chains, maybe have been pulled up too quickly, can happen. It's thought that uh, because the left laryngeal nerve is somewhat longer than the right laryngeal nerve and loops around the base of the heart, it's more prone to trauma. I don't know from that, um, but that theory has been out there for a long amount of time. Uh, there are other causes. It's not just a traumatic disease. The condition is inherited in Siberian Huskies and Bouviers, and it's thought to be a degenerative change in the nucleus ambiguous. Um, it has been identified as part of a uh, polyneuropathy in Rottweilers. It may be seen in a number of toxicities, including lead poison or anything that causes a neuropathy, and it's been identified as part of uh, polyneuritis in a number of different uh, species. The disease is most often bilateral, and when this happens, it predisposes because of the sagging of the uh, uh, retinoideus folds into the uh, uh, lumen. It certainly predisposes to stertor, um, to a decreased athletic performance in athletic animals, and may contribute to aspiration in some animals. 
Here's a very similar leash and this one is bilateral except one side is a little more affected. Um, you can see that the laryngeal orifice is compromised. And this is a horse. Um, in horses, uh, it is both heritable and the result of low-grade chronic trauma. It's thought to occur in draft breeds due to pulling, where they're constantly pulling against a yoke and cause, can cause damage to the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, it is heritable in a number of different breeds, and it's also been associated with in some types of plant intoxications in horses, including chickpeas and lathyrus species. Uh, generally in damage of this, and then we can move on to one more picture, which shows you damage on the left side or the right side of this picture. You can see that this muscle is a little flatter. There's less to it than this muscle. It's allowed the area epiglottic fold, which is normally retracted by the actions of primarily the dorsal cricoretinoideus muscle and the lateral. They're both affected. The lateral is usually affected first, but it really doesn't do all that much. When the dorsal is affected, then it just flops inward. Uh, notice we're looking at a horse again, and we have this lymphoid proliferation. So, um, so the laterals, uh, cricoretinoids are, uh, is affected first. The dorsal, which uh, is larger and has more uh, action here, is affected second. And the cricothyroid muscle is not affected at all. So that's roar or laryngeal paralysis that you can see. And it's all due to damage somewhere along the line of the recurrent laryngeal nerve or the nucleus ambiguous where it uh, ends up at. Okay, uh, this is a non-specific finding in ox, and this is a case of laryngeal edema. And you can imagine how difficult it was for this particular ox to, uh, uh, to breathe. Uh, in cattle, laryngeal edema has a number of causes. It's been seen in urticaria. It's been seen in serum sickness and anaphylaxis. It's also been seen in uh, uh, animals with black leg or other forms of local inflammation. Um, you can also see it as a result of hyperthermia. And the animals are breathing very hard and breathing very fast. We've seen the effects on that in the lung. And you can also have effects in the larynx and the trachea as well with the tremendous heat and, and, and the powerful breath that these animals can generate. More evidence of the tremendous uh, damage that uh, uh, dyspnea can do, especially in uh, cattle, is a condition which is referred to as honker syndrome. Okay, this is severe submucosal edema of the trachea, and it's seen often in feedlot cattle, especially those with bronchopneumonia. We've talked about the, the uh, uh, bovine respiratory distress syndrome or, or disease complex, excuse me, bovine respiratory disease complex that you see in feedlots, and you get tremendous tracheal edema and hemorrhage in these animals. Usually it's seen in summer, and uh, uh, it's one of those things that if they are making the very characteristic honking noise and not moving, you don't move them because they very well may asphyxiate and drop dead right there on the spot. There's not really much of a treatment for this. Nobody knows uh, what causes it. Uh, concurrent uh, lung disease, excessive fat accumulation in the thoracic inlet, hypersensitivity to various molds and mycotoxins have all been sort of uh, purported to contribute to this, but nobody really knows. But people who work around feedlots, they certainly know how to recognize it. Let's move into the chest. And as I've always said, there's really no good time to have your intestine in your chest. Diaphragmatic hernias, um, uh, they will arise from two uh, different causes. Some may be heritable and some are traumatic. And general, as a general rule, and it doesn't work all the time, as a general rule, uh, the traumatic 
ones are associated with rents in the muscle so the animal gets hit by a car this muscle will tear okay and then the intestine and in this case a little bit of liver have popped through that tear okay you have the muscular part at the bottom and then where the aorta and the uh, esophagus comes through it's more tendinous and the tendinous areas are the ones where you tend to see more of the congenital lesions doesn't matter how big uh, the animal is you can uh, You can see them in horses as well. Um, you can hit a horse with a bus or a truck and that happens from time to time. Um, there are a couple of other causes that uh, probably bear mentioning um, dystocias, especially in horses where birth is a fairly violent and quick process. Dystocia can cause a lot of problems to the mare. This is one that doesn't get a lot of airplay, but you can, the animal's pushing so hard, it can cause a rent in its own diaphragm and you can have uh, movement of the intestines and other organs into the uh, uh, into the intestinal cavity. Look, here's here's part of the colon way up in front of the uh, in front of the heart. Okay, things that should not be in the lungs. It's a a form of aspiration. When I think about aspiration pneumonia, I usually think about the pictures that we've seen where the animal vomits it, inhales it, and then you have tremendous necrotic effects due to the gastric acid, the presence of bacteria and protozoa and all that. But there are things that occasionally get instilled. There is nothing that should go in the lungs except for oxygen in and out in certain concentrations, even antibiotics. Um, you, you see that fairly commonly in weak animals, especially small animals like ferrets or, or kittens or something where somebody's administering food or they're administering antibiotics um, by a syringe and, and it inevitably ends up in the, uh, uh, in the lungs. Well, this is a case uh, that is uh, aspiration of kaopectate. The animal was being given uh, a kaopectate for diarrhea Unfortunately, uh, this was a, a calf, and unfortunately, they got it into the wrong tube. It went straight down the trachea into the lung. You see this animal died um, having a lot of trouble breathing, and, and every alveolus in this field, at least, is uh, filled with this white material, caopectate. You will also see this from time to time in animals with barium, who've had barium studies, and they just, somebody gets the tube down the wrong the wrong hole and there it goes into the trachea. Oh, here's a good one. This is a, a lung from a horse and has this really nice shiny appearance because someone was treating it for colic and put the tube down the wrong hole or the wrong tube instead of going into the stomach and went into the lungs and filled them up with uh, mineral oil. That's got to be sort of messy. But not all of the things that appear in the lung and include the alveoli are exogenous. Okay, these are the lungs from a cat, and you can see within the subpleural alveoli there is a lot of accumulation of a yellowish material. And what this is, is this is lipid in a condition known as endogenous lipid pneumonia. It may happen spontaneously. It may also happen as a result of occlusion of the airways. If you occlude an airway, say the animal hair inhales a large stick or something and blocks up one of its airways, okay, a lot of the this material, this fat and macrophages, um, will accumulate in the alveoli downstream. Okay, so in most cases, um, you see this in cats, you can see it in uh, mustelids, any fur-bearing mammals, it's very common, but any species can get it a little bit. Um, it's usually subplural, or most commonly subplural, and the yellowish discoloration is the result of the oxidation of the fat. When you oxidize fat, it turns yellow. And so all of this fat is accumulated, and it's, it's lipid material, I won't say it's fat, I don't want to, to make you think it's like adipocytes or anything, but it's lipid material, probably a lot of lipid from surfactant, and it's gobbled up by alveolar macrophages, there's some lymphocytes in there to give it a nice appearance of, of subpleural granulomas or histiocytic inflammation. And it usually doesn't extend too deeply into the alveolar parenchyma. It's a subpleural event in most cases, but it certainly 
can look very significant. Oh, here's a really nice case. Um, but this is just, there's nothing really fancy about this particular lesion, but I do like it because it sort of um, demonstrates one uh, fact about pulmonary edema. Pulmonary edema comes in from the hilus, comes in from the blood, okay? It's not inhaled or anything like this. So you can see how this is a diffuse change. It's working its way down the uh, down the lung. There's so much fluid that you can actually see uh, uh, rib impressions. When I see this um, in a horse, I'm thinking of a, a number of things, and it's often dependent on the age of the horse. If it's a very young foal or a, a stillborn or a bordis, my mind is going to go initially and, and almost irre irrevocably to uh, equine herpes virus type 1, in which uh, you can see small foci of necrosis, but one of the very characteristic findings is pulmonary edema. Uh, you can see this in older horses with a variety of infections, including post-streptococcal vasculitis or uh, purpura hemorrhagica, maybe equine viral arteritis, African horse sickness, and in and, and older animals, older than that, maybe heart failure or something like that. So this is a very nonspecific lesion, but I think a very pretty and illustrative lesion about the pathogenesis of, uh, of pulmonary edema. I think you probably also need to consider, uh, and I think they're pretty uncommon, but septic animals, you can see pulmonary thrombi. So have to be pretty big thrombus. Another reason that you see um, for bleeding in horses is a very common finding. Um, and there's been some great papers put out in the last 10 years or so, especially one by Dr. Kurt Williams up at Michigan State University. We are no, no relation. Um, I wish I had his brains. But, uh, but he has done a lot of work with exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage, or bleeders, as they're called on the racetrack. And almost all racing horses, because of the tremendous pressures that they generate in their lungs, have some bleeding. And if you have a racehorse, um, put an iron stain on uh, a section of lung, and I bet you're going to find a little pigment in here. But only about less than 10% clinically ever have any problem. Um, and it's just due to a failure of capillary integrity, due to the high pressures that they uh, um, that they exert. Uh, a lot of these horses on initial examination, you see a lot of fibrosis in the lung. And then you, you want to think, oh, is this uh, fibrosis in the lung then causing this animal to be a bleeder? And it turns out that if you take horses and you insert or instill uh, blood into their lungs, it will cause fibrosis. So it's probably a effect of the bleeding, not a cause of the bleeding. But you do see a bronchiolitis and, and a little bronchiolar fibrosis as well as septal fibrosis in these animals. Um, we know that the severity increases with age. It certainly increases with the severity of exertion. And most of the bleeding that you will see will be in the dorsal caudal areas of the lungs. In this case, you have sort of an asymmetrical distribution, but exercise-induced pulmonary hemorrhage. And look for that paper in VetPath a number of years ago from Kurt Williams if you're interested in this. It's an absolutely fantastic picture um, from Paul Stromberg, and this is a case of meconium aspiration. Uh, in a foal. Um, it's not uncommon if you look at histologic sections from even, uh, I won't say normal stillborns, but animals that die from unrelated causes, um, to see uh, meconium and some squames, which is just uh, uh, sloughed skin within the lungs. It, it's normal they inhale this or whatever, but when you see this much, when you see this much that the lungs are discolored. You know that this animal has been in distress during the birth process or shortly before. When they're in distress, when they are oxygen deprived or anything like that, um, they are going to, uh, they're going to poop and they're going to poop uh, into the amniotic sac and they're going to, they're going to empty as much of their gut as they can and they're going to inhale it. 
it's okay to inhale a little bit it's bad to inhale a lot this is a sign of fetal distress usually the animal will come out and be covered with a bright yellow orange poop and um, but I've never seen a, a case of meconium aspiration that this is so grossly apparent as this particular picture. All of this yellow material within the alveoli, you can even see some in the airways, is all meconium. So meconium aspiration. Uh, if you see it, there's been a problem during the birth process. Okay, here's a cat, and the thorax is full of a very thin whitish fluid. Now, when I look at something like this, when I see that, I gotta think, okay, what, what's going on? Can the cat have cardiomyopathy? It tends to be a little bit darker. Can it can have FIP. Usually there's some fiber strands. When I see something like this, um, this sort of milky white, this is chyle. It's accumulation uh, in the pleural space. Chylothorax is a very complex condition that uh, is almost impossible to find a, uh, a cause for. I've you know, there are a lot of uh, theories about compression or rupture of the thoracic duct. I've never been able to identify one of those. I know people that have gone in and tied it off and, and have uh, caused this lesion, but I've just never been able to uh, find a torn thoracic duct. Now, the thoracic duct could be occluded um, by some form of neoplasms uh, like lymphoma or space op occupying mass, perhaps that compresses it against the uh, ver vertebral bodies. But uh, it's not something I've had a whole lot of luck with. You just end up with chylothorax as your diagnosis. You can see in multiple species, including this rat here. So chylothorax, for me, one of those very um, disappointing diseases like cirrhosis where you never really get to a cause. Oh, I probably should have put this up. We've, we've mentioned aspiration pneumonia a couple times and this is a sheep. This is a sheep and this sheep has been back in the days where you know, before we had pace formulation, everybody used to drench the animals and you would give it some warmer and it'd be a big thing of fluid and you you take the sheep and you would put it on its behind and you put the, the syringe in its mouth and, and you let it go. Or you put a tube down and you'd instill it. Um, but if you got into the wrong thing, into the wrong place, this is where it happens. And you're, you're asking me, well, why is it in, in the craniovental lung? Because normally um, if you uh, uh, if you put something in the lung and then you push it, it'll just go down the craniovental lung. Well, it all has to do with position. And when you're drenching sheep, you put them on their butts, you know, and they just sort of sit there and they don't, don't do much. And so when you instill stuff into the lung, it goes down and drips down the bronchi and goes down to the lowest part, which is the becal lung. This is a very common spot uh, for uh, aspiration pneumonia in bipeds, like non-human primates and people. So sheep are a little different because the way they're drenched. In the vast majority of animals, aspiration pneumonia is gonna be in the anteroventral portions of the lung. It's just a little different when you get the sheep. As I said before, putting stuff in the lung, nothing good is gonna come from that. Oh, here's a, a great picture of the torsion of a lung in a dog. Um, when we say lung torsions, um, it's most commonly seen in the right medial lobe because there's very little connection um, to that. Even a, And you can see it in the uh, uh, left uh, medial lobe as well. But the right one is the one that basically has, has very few uh, tendinous attachments to the other lobe. Basically, all you have is the hilar blood vessel. So it, if anything's going to spin, that's the one that's generally going to spin. It looks a lot bigger than it actually is here because it is full of venous blood. You have venous congestion here and uh, usually seen in deep chested dogs such as uh, the hounds, the sight hounds like an Afghan hound, maybe a greyhound. Not, an, not a common finding. Another species that gets a fair amount of lung torsions is uh, our rabbits. 
So just file that one away. There was a great case in the Wednesday Slide Conference probably about five or six years ago of lung torsion in a rabbit. Pretty much what you would expect, just massive hemorrhage and, and necrosis. But uh, think about lung torsions when you get to that. Disease I don't know a whole lot about, and I, I think that there is still some controversy. Uh, these pictures, I believe, are out of veterinary pathology in an article that was published a couple of years ago. But uh, one of the things that you can see both in marine mammals, and it's not too uncommon to see it in fish. I think it's well established in fish, um, in super saturated uh, water which has too much oxygen in it, usually due to an overactive filtration system, is gas bubble disease. And uh, uh, these are probably from marine mammals. It's seen not uncommonly in gill net drowned marine mammals. Uh, or animals, and one of the more controversial things is for many years, people have blamed sonar of Navy subs and and testing of underwater munitions for this and I don't know how much actual truth there is but it is a real condition and you can see uh, in this liver and in this heart the presence of these large gas bubbles and and they can cause embolization and occlusion of vessels and it's not something that you really want uh, you know, most of these especially the the whales have uh, they dive to tremendous depths and they have ways to control this but uh, um, so it's been called gas and fat embolic syndrome um, it's been identified as a cause for a number of mass strandings so there's a lot still to be known about something like this in in fish you will see uh, see gas bubbles in the vessels of the gill or the fin or some of the small vessels as we said before, super saturated. If your, your filtration system is just bubbling away and putting too much oxygen in that water, you may end up with gas bubble disease in the fish. Hey, let's wind up these miscellaneous by one other disease which can be seen spontaneously in uh, certain inbred strains of mice like C3Hs, um, but also is commonly seen as a result to any other type of pulmonary injury like uh, a, a neoplastic disease, infectious disease. And this is known as acidophilic macrophage pneumonia. Now it's sort of a bad name for this disease because macrophages themselves are just regular old macrophages. But what the, the difference here is that they uh, contain large numbers of spicular brightly eosinophilic crystal and that's the acidophilic part of the name so i'd rename this one if i could but uh, they have these long eosinophilic crystals which were initially called charcoal-laden crystals now they're just known to be a combination of ym1 and ym2 chitinases with a couple of other uh, uh, compounds like granulocytic breakdown products and, and a little bit of iron and so you'll see these very brightly eosinophilic macrophages. You have to go down pretty close to see the actual spicules. Um, and you'll see them throughout the lung in a variety of conditions. And it's very common if you see a pulmonary neoplasm in a mouse, which we're gonna talk a little bit about tomorrow. Um, around the edges of that, you will see it. So um, we talked about C3Hs, it's also seen in uh, uh, B6 mice, uh, various in breast strains of, of Swiss mice and, and 129s. Um, another thing that you can see, it's not just in the lung, in some of these animals you may also see uh, crystalline formation, these bright eosinophilic crystals, uh, which is referred to as hyalinosis of epithelium in a range of organs, including the, the liver and the lung, the uterus, and the urinary tract. And just one more picture. This is, this is why I find mouse gross pathology of the lungs generally very unrewarding because with the exception of certain infectious diseases which cause bronchiectasis, a lot of them just look like this. So if you if you ask me what this was, I would give you a long laundry list. And, and you know, acidophilic macrophage pneumonia is going to be on this, but then you're also going to have pneumocystis and you're going to have a number of viruses, primarily in immunosuppressed mice, like norovirus and pneumovirus or even Sendai virus. They all just end up looking like this and just fairly unrewarding for me. And that brings us to the end slide. So 
Uh, tomorrow we have the last, the 14th lecture. We're going to talk about neoplastic disease of the lung. So I hope you're going to come back for that. I hope that you are enjoying these lectures as much as I'm enjoying seeing all of my old friends here, all of these great pictures that I've used over the years, and uh, get to see them at least one more time. Um, until I see you again, or you see me again, please stay well, stay happy, and enjoy good health. I'll talk.